it is my really great pleasure to introduce the poet and playwright Rita Ann Higgins. Um, we share the same surname, but that's where our connection ends. There's a great surname, I have to say. Um, and uh, one of Rita Ann Higgins' great lines, I think, um, is, for Christ's sake, learn to type and have something to fall back on. <laughs> She's a, a, a poet with that kind of um, insistence and energy and um, there, there's something vibrant and real. She, Rita Ann Higgins was born in Galway, um, one of 13 children, and she left school at 14. She began to write poetry in her 20s after having been hospitalized with tuberculosis. Rita Ann's work often tackles issues such as social inequality, and she combines passion, conviction, and wit. She's a great choice for a conference with it, um, the theme, Descent. Rita Ann has published 11 books of poetry, including Tonglish, Irish is Changing Mother, Ireland is Changing Mother, and Throw in the Vials, New and Selected Poems. She has recently written two short films in Irish. The poet George um, Smith said in Poetry Ireland, Higgins has always been a poet with a distinctive stance, never shirking her responsibilities as a public voice, speaking on behalf of those who do not possess such a platform. She is both jocular and jugular, two traits that combine to make her a singular voice in Irish poetry. Passion and conviction walk hand in hand in these poems. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the jocular woman who can pierce the jugular, uh, Rita Ann Higgins. Goramila Mahagat Saroshi, a Sokhtan Karela, her special shin. Thanks a million, Roisin, for that very special introduction. Uh, I'll keep an eye on, keep an eye on Simon, because he's got to tell me when to stop. Uh, don't be put off by all the books. That's just for show. <laughs> I'll just be here for a very brief period. Um, I just say, first of all, about Belfast, I went for a little walk today. It's very clean and it's very posh. And uh, they, they were, you know, I didn't really know that. L like I hadn't been here for a long time and that was what struck me about it. Um, the first poem I'd like to read might feed into um, the conversation before this about institutions. And uh, it's about, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, uh, what's it called? No, at all. Oh, Karanua. So Karanua literally translated means uh, new friend. So Karanua is an organization to help improve the lives of people who've um, suffered in industrial, <clears throat> and been in industrial schools or suffered in that way. So uh, one day I heard this conversation on the Joe Duffy show and people were ringing in and uh, the CEO of the Karanua was responding. So I'll just omit her name for fear of defamation and uh, I'll bleep it out now. I don't know why, I mean, I'd be nice ever, but I'm going to be nice because I'm in clean Belfast. <laughs> uh, it suits a narrative. It suits a narrative of the big bad state and the big bad religious congregations. Bleep, bleep, CEO of Karanua, the Irish Times, March the 20th, 2017. Some applicants will never be happy, and grievances suit a narrative of the big bad church and the big bad state and the big bad building with the big bad gate. We ration our compassion 
while all ye say suits a narrative of the big bad state. We ration our compassion, but we'll give you a couch. We ration our compassion, but we'll give you new windows. We are the keepers of the church's money. As keepers, we divvy and we pay, but not to you directly. We won't give you money, but we'll give you new teeth, a new radiator, a brand new funeral. What more could you ask for? It's not that we want your pain to be everlasting, but by the same token, it suits a narrative for ye to come on national radio and complain and say we have no compassion. We have oodles of it, but we ration our compassion. If we give you stuff without humiliating you, it will be no fun at all. So fill out that form and then fill another and another and another and one for your sister and one for your brother and while you're at it, one for your mother. Don't listen to the guy who said criminal records are given out like Holy Communion to people in institutions. We all, knew, we all know he stole an apple. Otherwise, why would he have been there? Some applicants will never be happy and it suits a narrative of the big bad church and the big bad state and the big bad building with the big bad gate. So, no one ever kisses you is the name of this poem and uh, it's it's about I, I'd actually just read the poem rather than go into a long introduction because my, my time is limited all our, our time is limited by the way <laughs> anyway it's, it's really about kind of, we'll just say, pri privatizing uh, the, 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 you know, people on sick benefits and the dole, really, you could say. No one ever kisses you. The contract was won by a firm from across the pond. The bounty hunt the sickly and get them off the sick. The shtick they use is the tick boxer. They tick and they lock, eyeball to eyeball. It's like speed dating, only no one ever kisses you. The answers must be wrong, because they keep saying wrong answer. About your schizophrenic episodes, how long more are they going to last? I don't know. I have no control over them. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong answer. Pay by result. Pay by result, result scheme is mean. Next. When is your disability going to clear up? Wrong answer. Next. Could you buff the blades of an electric lawnmower while it is still in motion? Ah, no, I don't think so. That's the wrong answer. You are hereby off the sick. Don't bother ringing your doctor. We've already been there, done that. We get paid by results, you dolt. Close the door on your way out. And a friend of mine told me that her doctor was contacted by somebody who was saying to try and get the patients off the sick. And uh, that's, that's where I learned about that. And the company is a British company. I can't think of the name of it now, but... Anyway, this one is called Cavities. And it's really a harmless poem and I'm sticking in the odd harmless one, you know, just so that anyone who doesn't like the overtly political ones would like the harmless ones. And I could possibly win a few souls here and there. <laughs> anyway, I love this. I love the stories in the local paper, the City Tribune and the Colleague Tribune, the court cases, because they're always, they're so surreal. You would never really need to to read anything else, only the local papers for the, for the surreal element. And um, this is called Cavities. And the, the bit I read was about a man in the hospital and he had a claw hammer in his trousers. So anyway, here we go. <laughs> go figure, as they say in America. <laughs> cavities. They were standing on top of the wall, pirouetting between the broken glass and destiny. 
tossers with a death wish. But that's not what Mrs. N from number seven called them, and she was a daily mask -or. Then they started walking on cars, not, a dare, not as daring as broken glass shuffle, as the broken glass shuffle, but more destructive for the bonnets that buckled under their fried bread brains. Mrs. from number seven, who Mrs. Nothing said, I know them gobshites and all belonging to them. Their grandfather, nicknamed the dentist, couldn't look at an apple because he hadn't four teeth to rub together, was caught coming out of the sacristy just before the preamble of the 14 Holy Helpers Novena with a claw hammer down his pants. We all knew he was using that claw hammer to pluck teeth out of his hole. That's it. Thank you. And uh, I forgot to say it, but I'd, um, I'd like to dedicate uh, this reading to my friend Mary Dempsey. Let's see if I follow that down. Um, I'm, I suffer a little bit from insomnia and when I, well, that could be in the past tense because I just convinced my doctor to give me sleeping tablets and they're really nice. <laughs> so, I have them, because <laughs> he on, he'll only give me 14, so I have them so that they last the month. So, uh, but anyway, they're really good, love them. And I, lo I love looking, the Fitbit telling me how long I slept, it's a fucking, it's a, <laughs> It's a total a fucking obsession, let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, um, he sings happy songs. So this, so one of the, one of the nights that I couldn't, one of the many nights that I couldn't sleep, I was listening to the radio and I heard this man talking about uh, being homeless and how some people put on the sprinklers outside the shops to prevent you prevent anybody from sleeping there. So. I, I can't identify with being homeless, so I, I'd love to meet him because I never, uh, the word he used actually, goof, was his word. And this is the poem. He sings happy songs. At 3 a.m. in a goof from the cold, you try to feel your toes. The voice in your head says, where the fuck are my toes? Rent freeze, toe freeze, heart scald, more Joseph and Mary moments. No room in this doorstep, love. When is the baby due? Try the side of the tattoo shop. You and Mary might get lucky. It's a good skipper if you get in before the sprinklers come on. The sprinklers come on and drench your sleeping bag. What fool said homeless is a state of mind? We thought he was a poet, a fool poet, I'd say. The rent is too high. Try that doorway, but mind the sprinklers. That's what I tell them. They activate them seven times a night. You can dodge them if you never sleep, and you'll never sleep in Dante's doorway, looking for your toes, not in a wet sleeping bag anyway. Forget the one beds, unless you rob a bank to pay the rent. Jingling raises the rent because he can and he will and he'll do it again. Jingling sings happy songs. And the last one from that uh, particular sequence, which is uh, going into a, a book on, uh, with, with, es with essays or pieces, or I'm reluctant to call them essays because I, I think you have to define an essay. I wouldn't be able to define them as essays. They're just pieces. So this is the last one uh, of, of that series, we'll say. And it's, again, reading a, a piece in the paper about the health board sending out a memo uh, to the wrong place, or got, it got into the papers that they had sent out a memo and saying that the nurses did have the power to uh, get patients who had maybe been a little bit too long in, in the in the ward, and they could use um, they could use minimum force. So, like, I mean, I've, of all the outrageous things I ever read, I I couldn't believe this because 
Can you imagine the corruption that would go with that, with that permission? And I hope I have the right, the, the right version. They trespass against us. The memo said, get them out of that bed, make Lazarus out of the lot of them. By the head or the knee, a puck in the back, a knuckle in the nuts, a sweeping ankle throw, but no bruises, they trespass against us. Minimum force at all times, except at tea times. Give them nothing, no tea, no ham. Give them spam, they trespass against us. Unwilling or unable, get them out of that bed. Fed or unfed, get them out of that bed. But <clears throat> Fed or unfed, get them out of that bed. But no bruises, infirm or inform, who cares if they're warm, they trespass against us. They are blocking our beds, get them out on their heads, they trespass against us. Memo meant for senior management only, eyes only, written by their legal team, paid to, me, to be mean, paid but not seen, they trespass against us. I'd like to read a short poem, Oscailge, if you don't mind, and I'll read it in Irish first, and I'll read the English version. I wrote it in Irish, so I'll read it in Irish first. It's called Ciontoc, which means guilty. Vi me og, vi agla arm vi gakrud, vi na hirishi ag chakt, the far east, the Irish messenger of the Sacred Heart. August on Quijela Aku. Vime Kahar no Kuig Blin Dish. Vina Hirishi Ag Chakt. Vigaktine Imachak Ag Dol Quigan Ishtin. Ag Dol Arafran. Vibron or Bakdina. Durchi Lagia. Tha Bron or Maya. Vime Og. Vibron or Freshen. Durch me Lagia. Tha Bron or Maya. Virudeg and Ag Tarlu. Vina Hirishi Ag Chakt. Vi a ron aga sov ga flurshuk sa chak. Vi na hirishi ga flurshuk. Vi agla arm vi gakrud. Vi me kyontak. Vi na kyarka kyontak. Vi na madri kyontak. Vi na klokha kyontak. Vi an lina ilar a mohar kyontak. Vi an tabar kyontak. Dol mo jas. Vi me jgulair kyontak. Guilty. I was young. I was afraid of everything. The magazines were coming. The Far East and the Irish, the Far East, the Irish Messenger of the Sacred Heart and the rest of them. I was four or five years old. The magazines were coming. Everyone in, in the house was going to confession, going to mass. Everyone was sad. They said to God, we are sad, God. I was young, I was sad too. I said to God, I'm sad, God. Something was happening. The magazines were coming. Bread and jam was plentiful in the house. The magazines were plentiful. I was afraid of everything. I was guilty. The hens were guilty. The dogs were guilty. The stones were guilty. The line in the middle of the road was guilty. We were all... The well was guilty. We drank from it. We were all guilty. That was my little indulgence, you know. So, I wouldn't be doing that in Galway now at all. I'd be found out for sure. So, so again, uh, I know I'm going off the point slightly, but this is a very short poem about emotional uh, memory and how it can trip you up. The spark. I detest that spark that flew out of the fire and burnt my mother's leg. She cried out in agony, a language we could barely interpret. Some of us could barely walk. We didn't know how to help the one who always helped us. I think of that day now, over 50 years later. I'm lying by a pool in Lanzarote. I can't say for sure what sparked that memory. I can say for certain it cut to the bone. <clears throat> no one mentioned the roofer for Pat Mackey. 
We met the minister. We gave him buns. We admired his suit. The band played. We all clapped. No one mentioned the roofer, whose overtime was cut, whose undertime was cut, whose fringe was cut, whose shoelaces were cut, whose job was lost. We searched for his job, but it had disappeared. One of us should have said, hey minister, we like your suit, have a bun. Where are our jobs? But there was no point. He was here on a bun eating session, not a job finding session. His hands were tied, his tongue a marshmallow. Just go. Two. Yeah. We're down to two, or else he was being really rude. <laughs> Just so. one, one, one or the other. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so the final two. I think one of them could be the builder's mess. And one of them, oh, I should read something from the new book. I always forget about the new book. <laughs> I think that could be uh, Freudian, you know, if you have a new book and you forget about it. I think there's, some, I think there's something wrong there. So, okay, so we'll, we'll do cry and air because cause I have to go on a cry and air flight for, cr <laughs> for, <laughs> for crying out loud next week. No, I, I look at the, was it in that book? I look at the, I look at the, the table of contents. But sure, I'll have it before I find the table. Yeah. Anyway, um, crying air. I'll, I'll read this one first and I'll finish with the crying air. Uh, this is about the women of 1916. <clears throat> the state recognizes that by her life within the home, Article 4121, the Irish Constitution. Years before the offending article was ever conjured up by de Valera and the very Reverend John Charles McQuaid, with the help of a pack of Jesuits, the plan was set in train to banish these biddies back to their kitchen sinks. The banishing tool of choice was the airbrush. The women of 1916 did not sit back and wait in the wings of history with tricolour dribblers to mop the runny eggs from the chins of the rebels. These unmanageables were there from the start. They could knit a 32-county Ireland in plain and pearl with their eyes closed and never drop a stitch while rearing seven sons and as many daughters. The rifles they held were not for showing but for using. The handgun could nestle on a hip or be tucked into a petticoat, Webley, Colt, Smith and Wesson. Winnie with the Webley Carney was one of the last people out of the GPO, revolver in one hand, typewriter in the other. I write it out in a verse. Lily O'Brennan, Constance Markovich, Helen Maloney, Ellen Nelly Gifford, May Moore, Rosie Hackett, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, Margaret Skinner, Rose McNamara, Nell Ryan, Lizzie Mulhall, Kathleen Kitty Fleming, dot, dot, dot. Whenever green dresses are worn, some tricolour dribblers spill scorn. Thank you. And I'll finish. I meant to thank you eights in advance for the slight inspiration, but sure. He wouldn't hear me anyway, so, you know, what's the point? So anyway, uh, thanks a million. It's lovely to be in clean Belfast and lovely shops. I was in TK Maxx and um, I was looking for um, grapeseed extract. Couldn't find it. If you take too many sleeping tablets, it helps. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, only joking. Anyway, so I have to, I'm going on the crying air next week because I'm going to read in Liverpool on Friday night and I'm anxious, so I think I'll have to go to the doctor and get something for my anxiety. So, um, <laughs> extra sleeping tablets, 14 by 2. So, so anyway, here's the, here's the skinny, as they say, here's the story. And it was, it was absolutely fabulous uh, to, to read here this evening. Cry in air. 
The queue was long, the chatter rising up and down, the length of it was anxious, especially when the, from the elderly. Some crying air soldier is striking fear into the hearts of the passengers in Liverpool Airport. It was about carry-on luggage. It, <coughs> I wasn't too worried. My bag was small. I had used it several times before. The chief crier was walking up and down the queue, saying in a loud voice, you have three choices. If your bag does not fit in Exhibit A, pointing to the grill for mis measuring misery. One, you pay 70 euros cash. Two, you pay 70 euros by credit card. Or three, you leave the bag. Is, <coughs> is das klar? I have to rule out credit card as I had a problem with mine before I left home. None of this will apply to me anyway. I was only there for two days. How much money was I going to need? My small bag, my nifty bag, it will fit like toast. It didn't. <laughs> the wheel stuck out. Juggle things, a woman said. Rearrange things in the bag. It's a tiny bag. Stick your high heels in the side pocket and try again. The wheels still stuck out. The crier was a crying air soldier, and he was taking no prisoners. You have three choices, he said, over and over. We knew his choices by heart. We didn't need to hear them again. I asked him if his mother knew how he was treating people. <laughs> Don't go down that road with me, lady. Just, <clears throat> just pay the money or leave the bag. I got this Liverpool jersey for my grandson. It took all my spare cash. I'm a crying air soldier, lady. We don't do Mother Teresa crap. Pay the money or leave the bag. Can I speak to the manager, please? I'm the only manager you need to please. You have three choices, he said, clicking his teeth. You, pay, you can pay 70 euros cash, you can pay 70 euros by credit card, or you can leave the bag. He counted me down in minutes. You have 12 minutes, you have eight minutes, you have five minutes, you have no minutes. The crier won. I went down on my hands and knees and collected my belongings. I stuffed them into a nylon bag that I bought for a dollar in Canada months before. It had winners written on it. I left my nifty bag with the book wheels at the boarding gate. I felt like the biggest loser walking across the tarmac, small items falling out of the corner hole of my winner's bag. I looked back at the toothpaste, my travel size bottle of argan oil to nail down my wiry hair. A pair of pink knickers, 40 years too young for me. <coughs> I saw the crier, a lean and mean figure inside the glass just looking. A new queue was forming, there was misery to measure and he was hand picked to do it. He turned on his heel. I swear I heard a click. Thanks a million. Thank you.